that they couldn't really fully uh, grasp themselves. And then, you know, early 300s, you got Rome coming in and establishing Christianity uh, as the primary religion in Rome, which shifts the dynamics of Christianity because now you have power dynamics within a movement that was really ragtag, you know, poor group of a whole bunch of slaves and merchants traveling all around the place to now, you know, pastors are being decked out in all types of gear and stuff like that. And then at the same time, you have this crazy movement of Africa, uh, which I think a, a lot of times I've seen kind of gets overlooked in church history, but the contributions of, of really dope intellectual Africans to understanding some of these core doctrines that we now hold to, dudes like, you know, Augustine, dudes like uh, Tertullian, all of these cats who uh, you look up to, uh, you know, uh, Athanasius uh, called the Black Dwarf. And so all of these guys in those earlier years and the formation of what we now hold as Christianity, it's just a spectacular time. And then uh, been reading more about even, you know, the expansion of Christianity beyond those those lines early in those years that gets mm -hmm. kind of forgotten if they weren't tied to Rome in some sort. Mm -hmm. So, man, I like, it's crazy how much this small ragtag religion has so many interplays in the world, literally affairs at the time. And so, uh, yes, yeah, so I love that. A lot of the times when we talk about early theater history, we start with Greece and Rome. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And when Rome comes to power and um, Christianity sort of is on this ascent, mm -hmm. that completely changes the trajectory of Western theater as well. So that's a mm -hmm. this huge turning point wow. um, for us as well, because wow. up until that time, um, the theater had been part of the polytheist worship business. Wow, wow. And so when, when Christianity comes to power th via Rome, wow. um, they come in and they said, no, no, you can't be doing that anymore. <laughs> that's not what, yeah. that's, that pagan stuff, we can't have that. Wow. And so it completely shifts the tone of the kind mm. of theater that they're making. Mm. And, and in some areas, it just completely smothers it until mm -hmm somewhere about 900 or between nine and 1100. Hmm. And as um, the Benedictine sect is coming to power, oh, oh. Um, we get a lot of early church dramas. So wow. they're writing plays, uh, liturgical plays to help teach the non-literate churchgoers these wow. Bible stories and about morality and stuff. That's amazing. So, That's <laughs> amazing. <laughs> <laughs> That's history, is, history is the best. <laughs> um, I spent a summer in Rome mm. and um, I was interning with an opera company and I, d I didn't like opera um, and I didn't know that until I got there. Mm. Uh, but I was in Rome, so I was like, I guess I'll ride this yeah, right, 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 uh, right. <laughs> And I went to the strangest little museum, speaking of just like whatever, and it was the Museum of Making Pasta. Have you ever been to Rome? Never, like, never in my life. No, nah. we should go. Yeah, we should go. It hey. was, um, <laughs> yeah, if you, I mean, you know, once the plague is over, You're right, uh, right, right. <laughs> I had, I, I think there's this Rome is such a spiritual city, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, like to get a little deep, um, you intrigued for sure. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's just so there's so much, um, Christian history there, wow, and mm. it, I mean, it, yeah. yeah. Well, it was, even, on, even on theater, it's funny because, um, you know, like I've been studying Greek very heavily uh, mm -hmm. over the you know past like four years. Uh, and, you know, I'm looking at First Corinthians and uh, all the way, through, you know, the Gospels all the way through First Corinthians. And one of the interesting things that shows up is like the illustrations they use are often agricultural. So uh, being Jewish, they would use farming and all of that. The other one is what would happen in the stadium. So mm -hmm. uh, either Olympics, you know, running, racing, uh, or literally gladiator battle <laughs> fighting mm -hmm. those illustrations. And then that of theater. And some of like our favorite, most memorable passages. I mean, Jesus, even the language of hypocrites, you would call people hypocrites and you use that language over and over again. It, it is really just the word for actor. And mm -hmm. the call of, you know, Jesus is literally telling the church, like, um, hey, like, don't be, like, don't, don't take this Christian faith like you're an actor. <laughs> you're not in theater. <laughs> yeah. You're not playing a part. And 
Um, and, and so I find it, I find it fascinating all of the overlap. So as you were even talking about Rome, it was just running in my mind, just all of the overlaps between, yo, Christian history, mm-hmm. theatrical history. So uh, that's, that's, in, that's incredible. Yeah, it's, just, it's amazing that yeah, yeah. sort of the intersection of, of how these two things develop yeah. together separately yeah. sometimes and they, they, you know, have this path yeah. um, that kind of crisscrosses around. Um, fascinating. So we're gonna get we're gonna get uh, to my first question. So yep. I asked you to give me um, what your favorite passage is um, from the King James version, yeah. and you gave me two. They yep. are um, I'm gonna say them so our listeners can maybe check them out because yep. you know everything's on the internet these days. Yep. So you gave me um, Luke chapter nine verses twenty three through twenty seven, mm-hmm. and then Philippians two chapters one through eleven. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you yep. know, on your off time, listeners, go go check those out. They're actually both, I looked at them both, and both of them have like really awesome rhetorical yes. devices. Yes. Um, and so we're gonna, we're gonna break down some Shakespeare in a bit, and we're gonna break yeah. down this verse from the King James Bible in a bit. Mm-hmm. Um, but I want to ask you before, like, what's your, because a lot of preachers aren't using King James anymore. Mm -hmm. There's so many um, editions of the Bible that have been revised and edited and modernified and the new word of everything. Um, So of the newer editions, what would you say your favorite is? Yeah. So uh, right now it's, it's, uh, it's actually a fairly new edition. Uh, It used to be called the Holman Christian standard uh, version and now it's just called the CSB, uh, just the Christian Standard Bible. Uh, I love it. Uh, I think when you're looking at, you know, Bible translations, it's hard, right? Because uh, not only do you have this language that is being translated from, whether, you know, Hebrew, Aramaic, or Greek, um, but you also have it being translated into a specific realm of English. Mm-hmm. Um, and every time an English translator makes a decision, to use a particular word, um, most words, you know, pre, you know, prepositions and you know, small word and to, th- those are pretty easy. Uh, but it gets kind of tricky when you start to talk about, and we'll talk about this even in the Philippians passage. But it gets kind of tricky when you start to use when you start to talk about action verbs mm-hmm. that really can, you know, put a stamp on the meaning of a passage. Mm-hmm. If one word is used as opposed to uh, another. And one of the things even, you know, just obviously it's no secret. I'm a black man uh, and kind of told you about, you know, my time in Philly and all of that. And so one of the things that's like near and dear to my heart is how to make these ancient texts accessible to people who wouldn't really like think of reading them. And, yeah. uh, and, and obviously for my heart, for the scriptures, like, some some translations are very 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 difficult to understand Mm -hmm. but if you want to hold the integrity of the actual language that was used Mm -hmm. it's not as easy as saying let me make this sound as good as i can possibly make it sound you also got to find one that is is really accurate and holds tight to the sense of what was actually said when it was said Otherwise, you're you're basically changing it to mean what you want it to mean, say what you want it to say. And you might as well throw out the ancient text and just write your own <laughs> ideas out there. <laughs> so, uh, yes. so yeah. it really is uh, at this time like the CSB because I feel like it does the best job of making it accessible, but also maintaining the integrity of what was originally written. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there's a lot on, you know, versions out there. Like when King James version was written, uh, 1611, 1610 to 1611, um, you know, there were about seven ancient manuscripts that they were working from. Mm-hmm. So there's also like, okay, so what are we working from here? When you, you get to these newer versions, I mean, you're talking about thousands of manuscripts that they're working from that kind of help them understand, okay, here's more likely what was being said. And what's fascinating is not a lot changes in terms of word and language. And that's just a whole nother conversation about manuscripts in, in biblical history. But um, it is kind of cool like to see even the CSB and the King James Version. Yes, some of the differences that you see, 
But what's more fascinating is are some of the similarities. Um, and uh, yeah, it's just a powerful, you know, testament to, you know, how these guys, you know, translate these ancient texts. So, yeah, so CSB is my favorite right now, uh, for sure. Okay. Yep. We yep. get, um, so at Baltimore Shakespeare Factory, whenever you, you go in, you audition, um, and about a month before we start rehearsal, we have this thing called text work weekend. Mm. And so we come in, we show up and, and in that way, um, BSF is a little bit like a teaching theater because yeah. we're not so concerned um, about if you're a pro at Shakespeare, like right this moment, cause like, yeah. we're gonna work, we're gonna work yeah. on it with yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. And um, so part of the thing that we do in this text work before we get to our rehearsal period is mm. um, we're supposed to go through and paraphrase all wow. of our lines. Oh, wow. And so when wow. you talk about wow. um, the addition and looking at it and, yep. and we have to, it's, it's gotta be a word for word. So we have yep. to substitute every word, wow. um, except for like, you know, to from yep. uh -huh. even, uh -huh. even common verbs like yep. run, walk, yep. work, you know, trying to find yep. what's another word that I yep. can use. <laughs> um, yep. And, you know, it, oftentimes, Obviously, what he wrote was better, yep. um, because <laughs> yep. there was yep. a there was a culture of um, intellect mm -hmm. and and witticism mm -hmm. that's part of um, mm -hmm. this rising sort. There was a kind of a neoclassical bubble. Yes. So every yeah. now and again, speak it. We're never going to get away from Rome. No, right, right. <laughs> Every now and again, that Western yep. theater or the Western world as a whole mm -hmm. would rediscover the philosophies of Rome, the the yep. mathematicians, the all of it, and mm -hmm. they have this huge resurgence. Mm -hmm. And so, in this time period, that's what we're having, um, and that's yep. why in a, we see it in Shakespeare a lot. Mm -hmm. There are multiple mentions of characters or stories or adaptations of stories from Greek mythology that wow. he's kind of taken and wow. ar arranged for his own purposes and mm. then, you know, produced this story. Mm. So the, the ability to use rhetoric and to be intelligent and witty when you write, that's, yeah. you know, that's riding high on this yes. classic wave. <laughs> Thanks, <Yes>. Rome. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and so, yeah, we do, we do. And, and so we're trying to paraphrase and like make yeah. these translations. And I, and I feel like, a lot of the translations that I grew up reading, I have like two or three Bibles on my shelf. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, they're very direct, mm -hmm. like it's a very direct translation. Okay, I want to speak to that because like, I think that's one of the things that like, as I've been studying the Greek language, right? Mm -hmm. And reading, you know, reading the New Testament in its original language. There are so many like, uses of like wordplay rhyming mm -hmm. alliteration mm -hmm. that you miss so here's a, a difficult thing even with scripture is like it's 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 written in greek then it's translated to uh for you know if you read the king james version first to this old english and then it's almost re up <laughs> uh into mm -hmm. modern day english and it's funny because one of the things I really still appreciate about the King James version is the more I go back now and read the King James version, because I've just been out of the King James version for probably like 10 years or so. Mm -hmm. The more and more I go back, the more and more I realize how much they tried to maintain the artistry, mm -hmm. of it, uh, which is really, really, really sweet. Uh, and, and I have found like, yeah, our modern day, Maybe it's changing a little bit now, like in 2020, but our modern day scope on literature, right, is to find, what did he say? Facts. Yeah. How can we <laughs> yes. shorten this up, <laughs> yeah. simple it down? Yes. People yes. already don't want to be in church anyway. <laughs> so how can we... Yeah. <laughs> How can yep. we how can we wrap this up? Let's just make it Absolutely. as direct as possible. Absolutely. And you miss so much. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I mean, G, like you go through the gospels, Jesus, yo, he he to me, him and John, John uh the apostle are two of the most brilliant, just in terms of words, mm -hmm. uh, two of the most brilliant speakers and writers like I've ever read. <laughs> 
Um, yeah. Because, I mean, Jesus is used alliteration, rhyme, and wordplay is crazy. <laughs> I mean, it's like a hip-hop artist just, I mean, putting together all of these schemes and artistry and illustration, all those things. Um, and I see the same thing, you know, with John. And you read some of our more modern translations, and you, you really do lose uh, mm-hmm. some of that, man, the flow, the the art of it, not the black and white science of it, but the art of it and, mm-hmm. and the way it, it should cause you to feel. So, yeah. Yes. I was, yes. Yeah. And, and so I came to Shakespeare pretty much as I moved out east. Okay. Um, so I've been really focusing on Shakespeare as a performance area yeah. for, for just about that period of time. Wow. Um, but I have found in the five or six years that I've been spending a lot of time in Shakespeare mm-hmm. that it has improved and um, mm-hmm. improved my understanding of the King James Bible. Wow. And so now when I'm reading, I'm like, can we, go, can I go back to the King James? Cause yeah. this is just, <laughs> it's too direct. There's no poetry. Yeah. <laughs> I, oh, what's, yeah. give me some, give me some nice. Give me, give me some, don't give me this direct stuff. I don't, Absolutely. I don't, blah, blah, blah. Absolutely. And that, you know, that's something that, that dad and I have talked about, um, yeah. Reverend Hall. Yeah. Um, and we talk uh, a lot about mm-hmm. about the intersection of of acting and wow. preaching. Wow! Um, and so it's it's allowed us to be close in a way that I didn't anticipate. It's powerful. Um, because it's not only like, okay, how was your sermon? How was the message? How did you put it together? Mm. But he also talks to me about like his delivery, and he's like, yeah. you know, sometimes like I know the sermon is good but they're just not with me. And I'm like, dude, I feel you. Because sometimes we go out there and yep. we're performing yep. and the jokes are coming and nobody's laughing and you yep. feel it. There's this connection between you as the, the performer yep. and the audience who's listening to you. Yeah. And when you're vibing, it feels so good. It's, it's a beautiful exchange of like thought and ideas and energy. Mm-hmm. And when they're not with you, it yes. just, Feel it's the worst, and we go backstage sometimes. We're like, man, they need to drink some more because yeah. nothing is funny to them. Like, be ready. They are cold. You know, we warn yeah, each other. Absolutely, they're not gonna laugh. They need, wait till intermission. Let them drink a little bit more and mellow mm-hmm. out. Because, uh, because the the you know the exchange wow. is just not there. Wow. So when you were in school, I assume you studied Shakespeare because it's, mm-hmm. I know it's part of the Maryland curriculum because I'd be teaching it. It is. Uh, it is. Yeah. <laughs> so that means probably about eighth grade, you would have mm-hmm. studied Romeo and Juliet or maybe yes. Midsummer. Yeah, Midsummer. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and yeah, then about yeah. ninth grade, you might have done Romeo and Juliet or mm-hmm. maybe. It was Romeo and Juliet. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, you're fine. Yeah. And then, uh, I don't think you do in 10th grade and then like 11th grade is English literature yep. or American literature yep. and then 12th grade maybe Hamlet Othello maybe King Lear I think we did uh oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. we like I think we like watched the <laughs> the new oh uh, the uh, movie the yeah, with that Lawrence Fishburne uh-huh, in it uh-huh, bless think, his soul I think, I think that's what we did so, oh yeah. bless his soul yeah, yeah. so let's talk about prepping a sermon yeah and then that's going to lead us into our little, our little text work. I was excited. So when you decide, right, yeah. this, is, this is the passage that I'm going to work on this week, or this is what's on my heart, or yeah. however you get to that point, yeah. um, like, take me through, like, generally, like, step one is pick the verse. Step yeah. two yeah. is... Yeah. yeah, so mine is, is kind of, uh, I think I narrowed it down to, like, five steps or something like that, but forget okay. it's like seven, so... Um, so I want to read and reread and then reread and reread the text. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, uh, uh, I try to read it as many times as I possibly can, depending on the length of the text. Um, and then the next thing is to read the surrounding text. So like if there's a, uh, you know, if it's, we're in a, a letter epistle, you know, it, it matters because there's a logical flow of argument. This was written mm-hmm. in one letter. So he's building a case. So it's important to read what's before and after. Um, if it's a narrative, um, you know, you don't need to know all the events of the story, but you need to have, you know, some kind of awareness of where things have been and where they're headed. And especially what's the scene, you know, right before mm-hmm. and after those things. 
Um, so it's just a lot of reading, not, and I'm, I'm really either making mental notes or I'm jotting down little notes, but I'm just doing a lot of reading. And then I want to quickly move to giving myself a, a main understanding of the whole text. So like, what would, what does this mean? And, and I try to, I try to teach other preachers like seven words or less, tell me what this means. <laughs> so okay. if you can say it in a sentence, it means like somebody can wake you up in your sleep and you can say like, this text means this, this text means this. So uh, try to just sum it down in seven words or less what this means. Because if I get that, then it'll help me as I start to work on the details of the text. So try to break it down into, okay, the main thing I did is here, break it down into sub points. So that's kind of like step three. And then I'm starting to work on every single line. Uh, I want to, uh, so if I'm in obviously a New Testament, I'm trying to translate, you know, the, the passage and translate every verse. And then I want to give one line explanation for that verse. So very similar to how you said paraphrase mm -hmm. <laughs> literally every single line. Uh, I'm not necessarily paraphrasing, but, but I am trying to summarize that line in my own uh, words. Mm -hmm. um, and once I have all of that done, honestly, I have what is the basis of a sermon. Um, I, I'm able to explain it to my audience. Uh, I'm able to tell them what the big idea here is. So just in case they get lost in the sauce, you know, they start thinking about, man, how, how quickly can I get to lunch? <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, they could get right back in, jump in, because they know uh -huh. the big idea uh, is, is this. Um, and then the, the, after I do some of that grind work, uh, I'm trying to, you know, look at Greek words. What does this mean in its original language? Um, how, how does, how was this used throughout the course of history? There are words that we use like gentle in our minds that, okay, yeah, gentle. But when you start to look at, okay, what does gentle mean? Well, it was mm -hmm. like a word used in a courtroom, mm -hmm. uh, for how you would, how a judge would literally behave towards you know a defendant um, where they were stern on the law they didn't wiggle on the law but they were very soft on the person in front of them so when you get that understanding gentleness is not just being nice to everybody mm -hmm. <laughs> gentleness requires conviction that i actually believe what i'm saying and yet oh. towards you i'm going to be kind and 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 soft literally soft um mm -hmm. And I think even if Christians understood, you know, that simple idea about gentleness, right? They have a much, probably function a lot better in society, you know what I'm saying? And like, hey, be a lot less jerks. You know yes. Who um, are you telling? Because, <laughs> um, yeah, I, you know, something as simple as that, just knowing, uh, you know, the etymology of the word can, mm -hmm. can really help you to understand, okay, this is what he's talking about. He's not talking about Midwest nice. He's talking about actually holding to convictions, mm -hmm. <laughs> but being very, very soft uh, towards the person. So that's just an example, but I want to go through as much word work as I can. Mm -hmm. And after I've dug and dug and dug, I then go back. It's almost like math and check my work. Was my original understanding of what the overall understanding of this passage was actually true after I do the detailed work of syntax, grammar, all that. And most of the time it is because your first reading of something, just reading it, and just allowing is usually what it means. Like after you just, <laughs> it's usually 90% yep. of what it means. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, so usually it is. And after I'm done with that, then it's the homiletic portion where I want to give, uh, my title is usually just my main idea. <laughs> just give you all the yeah. stuff. Uh, and then I want to give illustrations. Uh, so just analogies that I'll, I'll use. And then application points. What does this mean uh, for the people? And for us, this is where it gets very specific to me. And then it is making sure our people recognize that whatever application point I have given, Jesus Christ is the only one who actually did it perfectly. <laughs> so that they don't walk away feeling like I'm a failure because I can't do this. You just told me like the Bible called me to do these three things and I can't do it. Yeah, God knows. <laughs> That's yeah. why he sent Jesus. <laughs> he did it perfectly. You can't. And uh, he died for you so that even if you fail, uh, he has succeeded where you failed and he took your penalty and, and then preached the resurrection. And that's I mean, the stuff, right? That's the shout. Hallelujah. Every single week, I want to get to that. And that is mm -hmm. my sermon prep in a nutshell. So, yeah. yeah.
Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So like there's some some sames and some differences. Yep. Absolutely. Um, so like when we're prepping um, for scene work, yeah. we do the reading. Lots of reading. So yeah. much reading. Or we're supposed to. Um, <laughs> yo, yo. And, yo. and for us, I think that there's benefits and there's kind of a risk benefit of mm -hmm. reading too much because um, we are, rather than seeking the divinity, yeah. right? We're seeking the humanity in, mm -hmm. in these characters wow. and wow. trying to wow. find um, how they're, they're, they're just, they're, they're human, their failings, their connections, their relationships. And because the, the humanity of the Shakespeare's characters that came yeah. out weird, but I'm going to, no, oh, that's talking cool. like it yep. didn't. Yep. Uh, like the humanity, th like that's what keeps us mm -hmm. performing 400 year old texts. Yes. <laughs> these stories are yep. so human. Yeah. And how they respond is so human. Yeah. And um, there's this line in, in Aristotle's Poetics, and mm -hmm. um, Poetics is sort of the early drama guidelines okay. and Aristotle okay. went through and he said, this is what drama should do. And this is what drama shouldn't do. Okay. Um, and one of the things he says is that comedy sees men's failures mm. and tragedy sees man's successes, wow. something like that. So when you're looking at comedy, you're looking at a man at his worst. Wow. And when you're looking at tragedy, you're looking wow. at a man at his best. Wow. Wow. Uh, I was like, ooh, wow. ooh, give me the tingles wow. and everything. And I was like, what is this? That's profound. Um, wow. wow. And so that's what, that's what we're trying to do. So whether you read a lot or you, you have to read enough to be comfortable verbalizing the thing. Mm -hmm. And then a lot of times what happens for us is when we get with our scene partners and we, we rehearse yeah. and we go through it and yeah. we, we, try different um what we call tactics yep. so there's always a an end goal yes to every piece of yeah. you know, every line to every speech yep. Yep. i'm trying to convince you to do something or give yep. me something or whatever yep. Yep. and yep. so what we experiment with is the tactics okay what is it how does it act if i beg right if my whole uh, demeanor is is begging how does it act if my demeanor is forceful how does it and how, oh, how does, that's, that's super insightful <laughs> right yeah, yeah. yeah. and yeah, yeah, and yeah, yeah. how does it change yeah. how the person responds and so if i come mm. in hard in a scene and if the person steps mm. to me or if the person backs mm. down those are two completely different scenes and then sometimes in the middle you have to change tactics because it's not working um, mm. and that's one of the things that i look for when i'm analyzing is if mm. i see a character say the same thing over and over and over that's a cue that it's not working because if i said give me your lunch money yeah and you said no yeah, yeah. <laughs> but i still want your lunch money i'm gonna keep asking you for it yeah I'm gonna keep asking for it yeah. until i get it and i'm yeah. gonna change my tactics i'm yeah. gonna be nice yeah. Yeah. i'll be mean i yeah. might try to bully you yeah yeah and depending on how you respond yeah that's how it, did I get it? Did I get my objective or not? <laughs> yeah, wow. And that's what we do in the rehearsal room wow. is we play with the intention and the objective wow. and how you best get what you want. Wow. And the best one or the one that's most effective or the one that's most emotionally provocative, mm. depending on the story that we're trying to tell, Wow. is usually the one that the audience sees at the end. Wow. <laughs> you guys don't see all the bad ones. <laughs> <laughs> so if you wow. went to a show and it yeah. wasn't good, yeah. trust that that was the best one they had to give you. Wow. What? <laughs> yeah, that, so, that was so the then, best one. How, how much does the text play into that? Like how you, you know, you talked about the different ways you could do it. Like how much does, it, does the actual lines play into the... So it depends on the theater, but at BSF, almost exclusively. So mm -hmm. when you talk, when you talked about um, looking at the, a little bit ahead of what yeah. what happened yeah. um, in acting, we call that given circumstances. Okay. Yeah. So and that's like what happened immediately before this moment. Yeah. And whatever those given circumstances are, mm -hmm. sort of help you inform. Yeah. How you go forward, yeah. right? Yeah, you yeah, you, yeah. you yeah. get that. Yeah. And so um, it, it's in the rhetoric. Mm -hmm. That's how we decide. 
Mm. So if it's um, a person who's using a lot of, and I don't know how deep in the Greek you get, but mm. in the people who are super, super into rhetoric, mm. each kind of rhetoric has a, like a, a Greek name. So there's mm -hmm. like broad categories and we mm -hmm. have um, repetition, substitution, mm -hmm. omission. Mm -hmm. um, I never remember them all. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Tom yeah. DeLise, the artistic director of BSF is gonna wanna wring my little neck <laughs> because I've been in about a billion plays at BSF and I've been to a billion text work weekends <laughs> and I still can't remember all of the categories yep. of um, rhetoric. Yep. Yep. Wait, uh, Oh, or I see. Okay, so, oh, what is it gonna? It's not gonna come up, mm. and I could just find it, but I'm not. Yep. So, yep. but but each actor I know tends to zero in on like one or two particular kinds of rhetoric, okay. and the easiest ones to spot are repetition. Yep. So, like looking at this passage that you gave me, um, this mm. is the passage from Philippians. Yep. So we have um, it starts off with if there. If there be, therefore, any consolation in Christ, mm -hmm. if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the spirit, if any um, bowels or mercies. Yep. Okay, so I'm just going to stop right there. Yep. So we have if any, if any, if any, three times right yes. there. Yeah. So that repetition um, in the Greek is, is a particular type. Yep. And there is a different name for a, a repetition like um, in Othello, um at the end of the play othello says put out the light and then put out the light so the first light yeah, is yeah. the light in the room uh -huh, and the second uh -huh. light is the light of his wife's life yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right put out the light then put out the uh -huh, light so uh -huh. that's a different kind of repetition uh -huh, uh -huh. and so depending on what the 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 purpose right how mm. am i using this language to convince you yeah. and there's probably i want to say somewhere between 15 or 20 different kinds of repetition wow. sort of within that umbrella wow. Um, wow. And, yep. and people who get into the nitty-gritty in the Greek can tell yep. you oh that's diacopy yep. oh that's whatever <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm not there yet in my yeah. Shakespeare journey <laughs> I'm still learning yeah yeah <laughs> um, but yeah so that, yep. that's so that's what I look at wow. and the more different kinds of rhetoric a character uses mm. generally we assume the more intelligent that character is so wow. if they're not using very complicated language wow. um or if they're not speaking in verse and i would say the king james version is all in verse it's not imperfect iambic pentameter it's close mm -hmm. um in certain mm -hmm. areas and and that's another yeah. way that we determine a character's emotional state so yeah. right iambic pentameter mm -hmm. is the five sets yep of two syllables, yeah. like every couple, there's an unstressed and a stressed mm. party in the couple. If the meter's yep. perfect, yep. but soft, what light through yonder window breaks, it mm. is the East and Juliet is the sun. Arise from sun and kill the envious moon. That's wow. perfect, perfect wow. sets of 10 wow. syllables. Yo. So that tells me as an actor that Romeo is in his complete perfect right mind mm. because his language is controlled, it's metered, and it's from the mind versus from the mind. Um, That's incredible. When you see uneven syllables, hmm. if the syllables are more or less than 10, yeah. That's a symbol that the character is not in their right mind. Wow. Um, and, and we call that a, a line with a feminine ending. Wow. So that's one of the ways that we can tell what emotional state our character is in. Mm. Are they speaking perfect 10 syllables? Are wow. they speaking perfect iambic? If mm. they're not, then we have to address why is that? Are they emotional? Are they sad? Are they afraid? Are they yeah. whatever? Yeah. And then from there, we kind of go forward. Mm. Uh, yeah. and make and, and then there's a little bit of like some brilliant stuff I do what I want it's crazy yeah, yeah. yeah. but yeah. The, I think that it, it 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 works it works here too yeah there's some points in this passage that um particularly in a unique way kind of highlight what I mean by the artistry that King James Version tried to maintain as um uh you know the group of people who translated this version um wanted to hold to as opposed mm -hmm. to 
uh, you know, the. I should have got my Bible <laughs> out, my teenage Bible out, so I could read this as a yes. comparison and yes. just the the difference. It's it's um, it's in, it's incredible, and one of the other reasons why I wanted to use this one is because verses six through eleven are what they would call one of the earliest hymns of the uh, church. Ooh, okay. So there's like two things at play here. It's like the text itself, but Paul introduces one of the earliest Christian hymns in verses six through eleven. So you also have really a, a song within a section, if you will, yeah. uh, of, uh, and he's using it as a teaching point. So that was another reason why I thought it was so powerful. And because of that, some of the language I think is necessarily artistic and mm -hmm. when it kind of gets, um, which I understand for simplicity's sake, you want to make it uh, accessible, but it's a tension, right? I want to make it accessible, but I will also want to keep the art. So. so you touched on something earlier that I want to circle back to, which yeah. is like being black yeah. and, and being black and the church. And you didn't mention this directly, but I'm kind of inferring it is, yeah. is that we do tend to have sort of a disparity in terms of like classical and arts-based education. Absolutely. And um, that, like I said, for me, working in Shakespeare for five years, Absolutely. but it took, it took a while for me to get comfortable with it. Mm -hmm. And then to be able to shift that comfort from Shakespeare to the Bible. Yeah. So we're, we're, we're both working in these 400 year old texts. Yeah. We're mm -hmm. both working with audiences at varying degrees of mm -hmm. education and interest and yeah. attention mm -hmm. um, and understanding Absolutely. and how do you manage that? Right. Yeah. I know why you're still preaching a 400 year old text. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I know exactly why you're still working on a 400 year old text. Yeah, yeah. And, and of course it's older than that because we're yeah. just talking about the King James version. Right. Right. We're not talking right. about whatever was lit written in the Latin or the Absolutely. Greek or what came over that was originally an oral, an oral tradition from the yeah. Hebrew. Yeah. So it's been through so many, and you know, this is, Absolutely. To get in my language box. Yeah, um, yeah. So my, I had two majors in college. One was theater and one was American Sign Language. Wow. And in ASL, there's not necessarily always a one-to-one, -one, uh -huh. word-to-word. And so um, when we were interpreting, you talk about editors making choices, right? Yeah. Um, we, that's what we were doing, like live on the fly. We're taking in information visually that, that our clients are producing Absolutely. and we're rolling it through the Rolodex in our head and then it's coming out the best way we can produce it. Yeah. And I can tell you from my experience, um, sometimes I didn't know like a good another word. So it might take me two or three words to get to that single word. Yes. And when you're working from a translation of a translation of a translation, and everybody has made an editorial decision about mm -hmm. what this word means or what that word means, mm -hmm. without even necessarily having a good understanding of Hebrew. Yes. Because in the Hebrew and the Aramaic, like all languages, right, yep. we have some words that we use culturally specifically yep. uh, now. Yep. And whatever cultural specific words we're using now are different than what it was 10 years ago. Yep. And the culturally specific words that you and I use as black people are maybe yep. different from the, from the words that our Latinx yep. people are using yep. or, um, yep. you know, yep. other Absolutely. people. And Absolutely. so it all stems from those choices that were made from the oral to bring the oral tradition into yeah. written. Mm -hmm. I read this book a few years ago called Zealot. Mm. And the guy who writes it is, I think he's Muslim, but he's a mm. Christian scholar by trade. Wow. Yep. And he talks about the word lesty, mm. um, which they translate uh -huh. as thieves, yep. Man is thieves or bandits. Yep. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh -huh. And he said uh -huh. that the, the cultural tradition of that word in Hebrew is more like mm. satator, mm -hmm. like um, a person who performs mm. sedition. Yep. Which is yep. a crime. Yep. 
but it's not necessarily the same as a bandit or a thief. Right. And so right. that had some very specific cultural connotations right. that when it's working its way from the Hebrew to the Greek, to the Latin, to the, uh -huh. it's taking all these dance steps. Yes. And so we have what we have, you know, yes. and I thought that that, that yes. just tickles my brain yes. um, as a linguist. I think if I yes. wasn't an actor, I would be a linguist because yes. I find language so fascinating. Like Me how too. is it that we get together and decide that this is a cup? Right. That this is a phone. <laughs> right. This right. could be a banana, and this right. could have been a watermelon. Right. How, who decided? I, I agree. And what's what's fascinating, I think, for me as a black man, looking at an ancient text like the New Testament, um, you have twenty-seven books written by you know a plethora of different uh, dudes at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, think about from twenty twenty to just 2000. There's so much it has even changed in that little time frame. And so we look at, you know, the 27 books of the New Testament and compared to the Old Testament, it's a relatively short time frame we're talking about. But even then language changes and you see Paul's earlier writings, him using different words to convey some of the same ideas mm -hmm. later on. So language is to me fascinating as well. But one of the things that like, I think has been it's made it even more of like a hope of mine, whether I'm the one to do it or not, is to work on a translation, at least of the New Testament, that is done by people of color. Mm -hmm. Because there are sections in, in some of the translations that simply because the scope of someone's experiences they can't see how this would make sense in its most natural form. Mm -hmm. So they're, they give, and this is what you're doing when you're translating, right? Like you said, like, I got to give three words because I don't have a word that conveys what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Um, well, there's other times where it's like, I know exactly the word that, can, that is a one-on-one, -on -one, right? But that doesn't mean the same thing in our context. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then there are subtle things, right? Like I'll give you one small, short example. In Luke's gospel, John the Baptist has all these people coming to him. Mm -hmm. And they're like, what should we do? So he says, bear fruit and keep in repentance. Don't need to explain that. But he gets down and he starts to explain to each group of people, here's what you need to do. Mm -hmm. So he talks to the tax collectors. Stop charging, overcharging people. Pay back. So all, everything, by the way, are justice issues. Mm -hmm. So then he gets down to the end and he's talking to the centurions or soldiers, however you want to translate that. And he says to them, and here's how most translates, uh, translation translated, he says, don't take a bribe. Now, it's fascinating to me because when you, when you get to the language in the Greek, there's nothing about money involved in what he's saying. Hmm. The, the most literal way of reading this is, don't make a false report. <laughs> now, oh <boy>. yeah, <laughs> yeah, like so. Bribe, it's almost like in today's age, right? Like, it's so few people are taking bribes. <laughs> you can just put it like that. Like, so right. few people are like, I'll take a little money on the side and I'll make a judgment like that. that, that that's very, especially when you're talking about police and all of that. Okay. But false reporting is <laughs> now mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> like it's something that's practiced. At least we've seen it happen in all of these very major cases in, in, the, in the nation. I'll leave it there. Yeah. So imagine reading bribe <laughs> mm -hmm. and it not doing anything to you because it really means very little in our day and age. Yeah, you're like, okay, don't take a bribe, whatever. Right. <laughs> But the original language actually speaks more clearly to mm -hmm. what we're actually facing in our day and age. Yeah. And it becomes a major justice issue, right? Mm -hmm. But the question is, why would translators translate it bribe? Well, it's probably because they don't have an experience of false reporting. They don't know what that looks like. They, they, in their mindset, they're like, yeah, that, that can't happen. Me, as a black man when i read that in greek knowing what this means mm -hmm. i'm like i'm sure that word for word <laughs> yeah that, i'm so sure you felt something yes 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 
And so there's so many moments like that, um, Bethany, that I just feel like, I don't know how to say it other than I wish there were versions that were written by people who have the experiences that other people have. Yeah. Because you're, you're a human being when you're doing translating. I believe the Bible is the word of God. And at the same time, no, when it comes to translating it, though, translating it, though, Mm-hmm. fallible broken human beings trying to do the best they can to translate this this text and yeah. in my opinion the more translations the better in some ways mm-hmm. <laughs> and honestly the diversity of translators <laughs> hey now. the better um mm-hmm. and, and and as a black man I, I feel like that's super important when it comes to ancient text like literally yeah. ancient text so um yeah that's just one yeah. of those things I'm yeah i d- oh man this, <laughs> i'm having so much fun yes <laughs> like when i when i was in school um and we would come up to a word that we didn't know yep um we would say uh well what does that mean like how do i how do i sign work just and even work is a simple sign right and yep. i don't remember everything that i learned yep. I don't use it as much as i used to yeah. but like so the sign for work is this Mm. um that's work yep but what is work are you talking about like the effort it takes to accomplish something are you talking about like going leaving your house every day and going to a place for a job job? (laughs) are you like what is work and so we used to get so sick of our interpreting teachers saying well what does that mean Mm. and we're like you know what it means (laughs) and she's like no but what does it mean yes if it's if it's the work it takes to do something, mm. then you might sign it uh, a little bit differently because yeah. um, ASL has a lot of like visual body cues yeah. as to as, yep. and then oh, we have these things called like classifiers, yeah, um, which are ways to describe a thing, yep, <laughs> to yep. describe what work is. Um, Yo, and, that's fascinating. <laughs> yeah, that's fascinating. Yeah, so it's like, what does that mean? And wow. so whenever I think about the, like those things that you mentioned. Mm. Mm. Um, and and then your emotional that, state too, kind something of. Something powerful you said though on sign language, and I think that ties in with theater and huh. preaching, is the expressions themselves communicate in between the lines as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's and it's why I personally believe in the old fashioned preach, <laughs> mm-hmm. and and it's probably why you believe in old fashioned theater, like because. There is something that can be communicated, yes, with words, but in your expressions. Like, I, I can't tell you, like, honestly, Shakespeare was hard for me, but then I would see it acted out, and you would see, like, mm-hmm. oh, he laughed at that. That was meant to be funny, because mm-hmm. I was thinking, like, that was a serious statement. Mm-hmm. But that was sarcasm that I yeah. didn't catch, but uh-huh. I caught it because of the response, the physical expression. Uh, of you know the people and um and, and and preaching the same way like you're explaining you're conveying it's why like i do not like stale preaching where it's just just saying what is what is in your notes mm-hmm. because you're trying to convey something that has yeah. so deep and rich of meaning like it 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 is something about sign language that just to me is at the heart and scope of any communication Mm-hmm. Just, I think sign has built so much in it, but there, I mean, all communication, I believe, should look like that and feel mm-hmm. like that where I'm communicating yes in words, but I'm also communicating with expression, like mm-hmm. a facial expression, my hands, everything, like everything's trying to convey something. Um, and it's at the heart of it. I want you to understand me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, and, you know, I have watched you on occasion okay. on the internet. Yep. Yep. I, and I think with the Zoom, right, in person, we talk about um, the, our ability to read nonverbal communication yeah. is so fast in person. Yeah. Yeah. Um, when we were, the statistics when I was in, when, in school for interpreting, mm. um, at the time, the statistics were like 90, what did they say? 93% mm. of what you communicate has nothing to do with the words coming out of your mouth. 
Yo, I believe it. Too. That much, you know, so you're only, the words are just 7% of what you've got going on. And that statistic might be changed by now because it's been some time since I was in my undergrad. Yeah. Um, mm. But, and we're, and our ability to perceive it at, wow. in person is so fast. Wow. And there's something about being on, on digital Mm. The, the way we are now and the yep. way a lot of church services are now yep. um where the delay mm -hmm. in the trade between our internet connections and i say this to my students all the time if yes. um, if any of my uh medical students are listening to this by yep. accident yep. um it's my chief feedback when i i um, one of my jobs is to give interpersonal feedback to medical students mm. before they go and sit in a room with a real patient so mm. like if they're being rude on accident yep. that's something that we can tell them about before they get there yes <laughs> um, and one of the things yes. that i'm consistently telling them is like our, our ability to process nonverbal communication in person is so fast but it's delayed in digital it's so true and then it's limited also because I only am seeing for you, like on your shoulders up. Yep. yep. I don't have the, I yep. don't have yep. access to the rest of yep. your body. Yep. Um, and even though we don't think of our like. Everything. Or so in our legs Everything. as overly communicative. Everything. They are like your whole body is working to communicate. Yes. Um, and I think especially for, for cultures where um, the, the, communication is active like yes we'd be talking with our hands i know yes. i'm so guilty yes. like if i had to sit on my hands and talk to someone i'd be confused yeah, yeah. and um yeah so you know all of that stuff and then we're just missing pieces out of it yeah. and so i wonder just real quick and then i prompt we'll get to we'll, you'll yes. do your yes. text work and yes. i'll do my text yes. work and yes. then yep. and then we'll get on with the day but like i wonder like what is your experience of mm -hmm. of delivering messages digitally yeah. and like yeah. is that anything that your members are making comments about or or how is that it's, working it's How's so that going? difficult uh the first uh we we started having a few more people in and uh but when we first COVID first hit i'm like just me and a camera and a cameraman oh um, man I, I mean i'm struggling because i am from a culture that's very expressive um it you know it's it's difficult just communicating to a culture that's not as expressive at times right but i should say your congregation is mixed it's yeah, a, it's a yeah, very yep, well absolutely, mixed conversation absolutely, congregation absolutely. young and old white yes. black latinx asian yep, like, yep, yep, it's very rainbow connection up in there yes <laughs> absolutely and so it it i mean you miss immediately and i'm sure imagine you know I guess this is what it feels like to do a movie or something like that, where mm -hmm. you don't have the audience. <laughs> and I mean, it, it's a weird feeling to get used to. I like, I don't think it's natural. If I could just put it like, I don't think it's just a natural thing to do. Yep. Me talking to someone who isn't right now seeing me, hoping that one day they will see me. It's just not, it's, it's just not natural. But um, one of the things I, that struck me as you talked about that was the difficulty with my words. So like, interestingly enough, like I don't preach with notes. So I, I Oh, the, wild man. Yeah, yeah right, 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 right. Look, so, what, I mean, if you get off, how do yeah, you get back? Yeah, it's, it's you know, it's, it's kind of like as much as I've downloaded in my head uh, and there's a long story to that, but yeah, um, like just felt like this is the best way of communicating. So I don't preach with notes. You know what's fascinating is as soon as there's no people there, the amount of times that like I lost my place in my head, the amount of times that I'm like, wait, where, what, what was, was what was my point again? And yo, I don't care if you're, it's a monologue, right? A preaching is, is a type of monologue. You're speaking to people, mm -hmm. but there is the grace of the facial expression when you lose your place, <laughs> even just that, mm -hmm. that like, they're still with you. They're waiting yes. for you, right? <laughs> yes, that they're like, uh-huh, yes. Yes, <laughs> when that's not there, even that affects how you speak. And so I, it, it is a drastically different thing communicating mm -hmm. without the, the visible audience. And it's again, one of those things where there's this like dope connection, I think between yeah, preaching and theater, 
uh, where the audience is a part that that's what makes theater theater. The audience is a part of the performance. Yeah. And I, I love that about preaching. There's a preacher I love who he says, preaching is where you take this beautiful synergy between the, the preacher and the, and the pew. And I'm like, Ooh, that is exactly too. what it is. Like, um, and you miss out on that, especially when you're doing a didgery. So, <laughs> well, and you have something in, in church that, that is something that we're actually trying to cultivate. And I think that mm-hmm. we're at a disadvantage in the theater for a couple mm-hmm. of reasons. Yeah. So, um, our theater audience is predominantly older and, yeah. and predominantly white, yep. um, even though we're in Baltimore. Yep. Um, because I, Shakespeare is seen as, as, as an elitist situation. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and mm-hmm. so what we've been trying to do as part of our performance mission is, is there's a lot of rhetorical questions yeah. in Shakespeare, um, yep. particularly when a character's on stage by themselves in, mm-hmm. in soliloquy mode. Yep. And so what we've been trying to do with our audiences is get them to get wow. them to respond right yeah. so um yeah. like in romeo and juliet yeah. she's in the balcony you know romeo romeo we're for the romeo yeah. and she pauses for a second and then romeo goes shall i hear more or shall i speak at this mm-hmm. and what we're trying to get our audience to do is tell us yeah should, yeah, yeah. Should, I, should i hear more yeah. or should i jump in there yeah. and like um we perform with the lights on it's part of mm-hmm. our uh, performance vision um yeah perform with the lights on, we direct address, we cross gender cast, wow. we respect the text, wow. all of this stuff. So like wow. they know what they're getting into when they show up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so yeah. we can see them very clearly. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Because the lights are on. That's and so I'm like making direct contact with yeah. my eyes and I'm asking them a question. We did um the Merry Wives of Windsor. Um mm. it was right about the time that Steve passed actually. I left that wow. rehearsal process for two weeks my to come home and be with mom. And then I went right back to rehearsal because uh, that's what we do because it's theater. And, <laughs> and so there's this portion where I'm on stage by myself. Um, mm. a, a, another character has sent my character a love letter. Mm. And what, what I discover is, one, is my lady friend, who's also married, has gotten the same love letter from the same guy. Yeah. So we're on stage. We're comparing our yeah. letters. And yeah. she goes, well, what should we do about this? And we both look wow. out at the audience. We're like, what should we? And we just waited. Mm. We just waited wow. until somebody was like, kick his butt. Yeah. And we were like, yes, you got it. Yes. Um, and so that's something that we're trying to do that happens in the church automatically. That's so dope. The black church, which Absolutely. is you're in the middle of something and they're like, say something. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, go yeah. head on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Uh-huh. And and they're giving you this this encouragement. You know, when uh-huh. you said the encouragement on the faces, like we're with you. That's what they say. Amen. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Talk, talk about it. Say it. Say it. And you're like, okay, I will. Yes. Thank you for being with me. And um Absolutely. I'll never Absolutely. forget it. Uh there was a a pastor that I listened to, um, mm. and he was a guest from someplace else. Yep was saying that he was really enjoying the music. He said, the, the soul is willing, but the flesh is Lutheran. And he was like, I just can't. <laughs> that is oh, and it tickled me. Thing. And that's what we're having. <laughs> you know, they feel like they can't because it, they're so used to it being this, like yeah. yep. they, they, certain people almost treat Shakespeare as like sacred. Yes. Like, I have yeah. seen people roll up to a performance with the text and they're like reading it with you, like, wow. like word checking oh, you that wow. that is how seriously oh. some Shakespeare enthusiasts treat the wow. text. Um, and so we're wow. trying to get them to loosen up. Yeah, yeah. I just wish like you need to go yeah. sit in a black church for a minute and like, then just come hear back. and then come, come back, back to us, go yeah. do that. <laughs> And then come back here and be ready because I'm going to have questions for you. Yes. Shall I hear more or shall I speak at this? You better be ready to answer Absolutely. me. <laughs> <That's perfect. laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> okay. So oh looking yes. at this text from Philippians. Yes. Yep. So if I was given this yeah. um, and they're like, hey, we, this is your new monologue now. Yeah. Or this, you're going to go and audition. And this is what we want you to say. Um. 
like we, we talked about a few minutes ago, the first thing that I'm going to start off with is this repetition. If mm. any, if any, if any. Mm. So those are things that in my reading or like as I would perform it, that I would be sure to stress. Yeah. And we have a couple of different ways that we tend to stress. Um, mm. Volume, mm -hmm. um, like tone, higher or lower or duration. Mm. Do you slow it down when you say it or do you like hit it real quick? Yo. I'm, that's how we i'm rocking with you <laughs> right you're hearing it so yes. it's like how am i gonna how no. am i going to let you know as the hearer that these are the parts and if they did this in church before they had old mother whoever read the uh -huh. sunday verse <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. um i think that it would be like way more interesting to listen to oh my goodness yeah, like yeah. all right <laughs> mother williams did you yes. do your text work for the reading <laughs> Can you imagine? Yes. <laughs> He'd be like, I, I didn't do it. No, no. <laughs> I left it on my grandson helped no. me, but I left it on the laptop. I couldn't get it to print. Oh, Mother Williams. Oh, oh Lordy. Uh, so that's where I would start. And then I would go go on to look for some other um some other repetitions because that's the yeah. one that I like. Yeah. And then the other one that I like to pay attention to is substitution, um, not substitutions, omissions. Mm. So where like they leave a part of it out that's mm. implied. They are, mm. They're imagining, the writer is imagining mm. that you're going to put that in, but they didn't uh, expressly say it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So that's yeah. another one that I yeah. look yeah. for. And then you've got this um, fun let look let um yes. in verses yes. um three yes. four and five uh -huh. Uh -huh. so you've got that l sound uh -huh. Uh -huh. um so that's something that i would pay attention to as a performer mm -hmm. um i mm -hmm. also like to pay attention to action verbs yes. a lot of times those action verbs are good places to put emphasis yes um yes so and then we also use um so we emphasize on rhetoric, we mm -hmm. emphasize on um, action verbs. And then the other thing as actors we emphasize on is, uh, I call them juicy words. Yep. <laughs> uh, just words that feel good in the mouth, yep. which is uh -huh. a strange yep. thing to say, Absolutely. you know, but it's just, you say yep. it and you're like, mm, I'm gonna say that again. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Church, say it with me. Yes. Turn to your neighbor and say yes. it. Absolutely. All, Absolutely. All of those. Yep. Um, and then let's see what I would look at, just looking at this some more. Um, also, I'm really interested in, um, let me see, this is, so I printed it out, but when I printed it out, it didn't put the numbers. Yeah. So I'm checking against my, my website here to get yeah. the number. So we have in um, verse eight, yep. and being found in the fashion as a man, he humbled himself, mm -hmm. right? We've got that parenthetical. Yep. Um, yep. That uh, that I would pay attention to because it's yep. not and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself. Yes. Uh, it's it's when he found this. Yes. This is what he did. Yes. And then he went on to do this other thing, right? So yes. we're trying to separate out the thoughts. Yep. Here he humbled himself and became yep. obedient unto death. Mm -hmm. Even death, bam, we got two deaths right there. Uh -huh. Even the death of the cross. Mm -hmm. um, yep. Going on to wherefore, also God hath highly exalted him. You got to hit that highly. Yeah, yeah. Right? <laughs> yep. Um, yep. And given him, so then we've got this exalted him, given him. So we've got this yeah. verb, subject, verb, subject, yes. um, which is really interesting. So mm -hmm. just even from that, the writer of this is like on point because we've got a bunch of different rhetorical devices. And do you, yes. did you go to seminary? Yep. Yep. I did. Do you study rhetoric at all in seminary? So we do, but, but I would say it's all a part of, um, it, it's the high, oh man. Cause this is what I love about hearing it from you because you're thinking communication. Yes. Seminary is thinking grammar understanding. So, oh. so there's, there's a different way you're looking at it when you're looking ultimately for the purpose of interpretation mm. than when you are looking ultimately for the purpose of communication. And when you're looking ultimately for the purpose of communication, you, you're highlighting different things. 
And that's why I, I, I find it so profound because um, I have to think as both. Yes, you do. <laughs> I have to think as an interpreter and I have to think as a communicator. Mm-hmm. And the the communicator side of me is just really excited right now <laughs> because you're, you're just going through and highlighting some of the things that are embedded in the text itself. There was one mm-hmm. you know preacher that said, the greatest part of the sermon is the reading of the passage. Mm-hmm. And that is literally... I think sometimes the most neglected part, but if you get a chance to preach the reading of the passage itself, just reading it and just read it in a way that emphasizes the repetition, the alliteration, the, you know, the contrast. I mean, you talked about the given a name that is above every name that came right after the humbled himself. Right. right. So there's this is major. Yeah. You've got humbled yes. and above <laughs> yeah. got that, that opposition. Yes. And you can even lower your voice as you're talking mm-hmm. about the humbled part and then higher heighten your voice as you're talking mm-hmm. about the exalt. So, and I, I, again, I think um, the black preaching tradition does an incredible job of just orating the reading. Of I agree. A text. So, I yeah. agree. No, that's phenomenal. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. Um, let's see. Wherefore God hath highly exalted him yeah. and given him a name which is above every name. Yeah. That yeah. at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under earth. Yeah. Things and things and things. Things and things. So the author thinks that's super important. Yes. Um, the things and things and things. Yes. Um, yes. Let's see. And then going on. And then I'll just, I'll read it all yep. in a row. Yep. Yep. <laughs> as if it was I my, as, as if wait. it was my 16 <laughs> lines. Okay. Yep. Um, and that every time. And see, so in these, in these editions, we get these italicized things. Mm-hmm. So in, in the um, edition that I'm looking at, things and things and things in verse 10, that's in italicis. Yeah. Um, and um, Jesus Christ is Lord, that mm-hmm. is, that being verb mm-hmm. is italicized. Mm-hmm. But then <clears throat> the that is italicized at the top mm-hmm. of 11. Yeah. And so, since that is such a mundane word for me as an actor Mm. i'd skip right over the lat and i'd go right to um probably tongue and confess yeah yeah because that doesn't seem like that's that that it should be that important (laughs) yep but yep if i read it the way that they meant it and i gotta back up a little bit to to kind of get into it because this is one long one long thing it is. it's it's uh wherefore god hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name boom yo pause this is the stuff yo and then they pick it up after and and we have to get all the way to the period so that's what mm-hmm. i tell my students is you have to find the stopping punctuation Ooh. so for the purposes of this we're talking about an exclamation point a question or a period semicolons yeah. and commas don't count so this is one long thought that starts in nine and goes all the way to 11, which is super dense. Yeah. And it's a lot of stuff in that thought that they want you to pay attention to. And that, that is, I think the, that, that they're talking about here. Yep. Yep. So all that stuff, yep. that's the stuff that will yep. cause every tongue to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and to the glory of God, the father. You, I have to come with me one day to help uh, some Look, I think I coming. think we're brewing a Shakespeare <laughs> by the Bible preacher intensive. Yes. Then I'm going to every Baptist you convention ever. Yes. <laughs> All right, so let me hear it then. Let me hear okay. it. Okay, okay, here, here we go. Then. Here we go. Yep. Mm-hmm. Um, if there be Therefore, any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the spirit, if any bowls and mercies, fill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in the lowliness of mind, let each esteemed better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. 
let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Let's see. And then that's this. First, who being in the form of God thought not a robbery, but be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, same thought, and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in the fashion as man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Yo. (laughs) Uh, I literally want to go preach this text now. (laughs) There you go. You're welcome. You did an incredible job. Thank you. Is it my turn now? It Uh, is. Let's just see. And and, and for me, I want to see. So I actified this passage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I I want you to kind of. Yeah sermonize yes. if you will yes. the passage that i gave you so for our audience's benefit mm-hmm. um i gave pastor gray the speech at the end of merchants of venice Portia's speech um the quality of mercy is not strength mm-hmm. i did not give him the whole speech because it goes on for some time i am sure <laughs> yeah i think it's um maybe it's at least twice that length. It may go on for another, I think it's something like 30 lines. Mm. Um, so the quality of mercy is not is one of the like mm. famous, famous, it, it's maybe second, like after to be or not to be. Wow. People don't like know it word for word. Yep. <laughs> but if you're like the quality of mercy is not strained, yep. they're like, I know that from somewhere, yep. <laughs> you know, the, the first, the, the two most alluded to texts, mm. literal, uh, I'm talking about allusions in literature are the Bible yeah. and Shakespeare. Yeah. And a lot of times if people didn't have any other books, mm-hmm. they had the Bible and Shakespeare. Um, so let's, let's, yep. let's see, what did you find? What did you find in that passage? Yeah. So, uh, I mean, literally the, the opening line is the main idea. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, the quality of mercy is not strain. Uh, and I talked about those less than seven words. You got less than seven. <laughs> yeah, there words. it is. So the main idea is given to you. So I would literally let, let make that the title of my sermon. The quality of mercy is not strain. Um, and then you go through and Now I'm looking at, okay, so what is he trying to say? So uh, I'm going to read it. So it says, it drops, uh, droppeth uh, as the gentle rain from heaven upon the place beneath. It is twice blessed. This is my favorite part right here. It blesses him that gives and him that takes. Mm -hmm. Tis mightiest in the mightiest. (laughs) It becomes the throne monarch better than his crown. It is enthroned in the hearts of kings. It is an attribute to God himself and earthly power doth then show like it's God's when mercy seasons justice. So uh, there's a lot here that uh, I would, you know, want to look at, but I would want to take that line. It blessed, uh, or here it is. Yeah, it is twice blessed. It blessed him that gives and him that takes. So that concept um, is funny because there's so many <laughs> biblical alliterations with this too. It dropped as gentle as rain from heaven. Mm-hmm. There's a passage literally from Jesus that he talks about how God rains, <laughs> sends rain upon the just and the unjust. Mm. And he's talking about uh, in the Sermon on the Mount, and he's talking about this very concept of God's mercy. He's kind not only to people who are friendly to him, but he's also kind of people who hate him. Mm -hmm. And and it's so interesting that he uses the concept of rain here because when Jesus used literally the word rain and he's using a metaphor, the, the beauty of rain itself is one of the best pictures of something like mercy because rain accomplishes so many different things. (laughs) Uh, rain literally helps, you know, so, uh, bring some water to hydrate the soil. Mm -hmm. 
um, for people who might have gardens or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Rain is also, if you have like a, a well or groundwater, it also helps fill up the groundwater. So, I mean, and then, so you got drinking, you got vegetation, but then on top of all of that, rain is what produces beautiful things that we love to look at. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we oftentimes overlook that, but without the rain, you're not having flowers that bring about romance. You're, uh, you know, having all of these just, I mean, beautiful things that start with rain and sunlight. So rain is such a perfect metaphor for mercy mm. because mercy is one of those things that it, it has so many different effects. You've seen mercy used to help a young man along who said like, man, I've given up on life. Now I have a, a focus in, uh, in, in life and wanted to go forward. You've seen something like Mercy literally call one person to reconcile a friendship or a family relationship that has been broken down for decades. And then you've seen also Mercy do this wonderful thing, uh, and I've even seen this uh, personally, in giving a picture to people of what something that they can't see is actually like. <laughs> he gets down yeah. to the end and that kind of, that would be my shifting moment, right? Of mm -hmm. getting down to his second thing of is the mightiest in the mightiest. It becomes the throne monarch better than his, than his crown. Mm -hmm. It is enthroned in the hearts of kings. It is an attribute of God himself. So mercy itself, when shown rightly, makes the invisible God visible. <laughs> oh, <laughs> and <Hey>. this is... <laughs> Um, this is really the concept that John is talking about in first John of love, like love makes the invisible God visible when people actually do what is right in loving. And then I love this when mercy seasons justice, Woo! I can stay there all day long. This will be my like, I that's like, the show. Yeah, that's the, <laughs> right. that's the show. Right. And the yeah. old, the old preachers used to call that the hoop. <laughs> I don't know if they call it that anymore, but yes, yeah, that's absolutely, absolutely. And again, it's this, this is idea that like, man, what is justice without mercy? Um, I, I think we're trying to answer that question, like literally right now. In our I day think we day. are too. Yeah. And the beautiful thing, uh, there's a passage in Habakkuk uh, and he says literally something very similar. He says, in, in your wrath, remember mercy. And it's mm. almost like, how can these two concepts of justice and mercy ever unite? How can they ever unite? And this is when I would bring it home and say the place that united was at the cross of Jesus Christ, where Jesus Christ took upon himself the justice that all of mankind deserved. Mm. And he poured out the mercy that they didn't. <laughs> and, <Ooh. laughs> and so mercy and justice literally kiss at the mm -hmm. cross of Jesus Christ. And this is why uh, at the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we now have hope that not only did the cross do this, but we have the receipt of the fact that mercy and just, justice kissed through the resurrection. So that's, that would be. <laughs> I think you've be. got two sermons on your hands. Your work is done. You can relax. You take two weeks off. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, but by the way, this is a really, really, really uh, dope, you know, text that you, you gave me mm -hmm. here. And I, I don't know if you picked it because of the justice part and the mercy. I mean, you gave me even the circumstances before. So like my mind was just like, yo, this is super timely too. So mm -hmm. yeah, it was, it was really dope. So, yes, I did think, I, <laughs> yeah, I thought about it. Like what? Yeah. What what can I give him? No. I wanted to, I wanted to give something that was um, pretty. I didn't want to give you anything that was from the. Uh, so Sh Shakespeare is kind of classified in like the good stuff. Yep. <laughs> um, and then the stuff that, mm, and then the uh, yeah. like the stuff that nobody does. Um, so I didn't want to yeah. give you anything from those last two categories. <laughs> uh, yep. Yeah. I'm not saying that there's not good stuff in there. I, I know um, what you mean. Yep. Yep. But it's just like people be preaching a lot of time. Yep. Matthew, Luke, Psalms. <laughs> when was the last time that yep. they're preaching out of, you know, 
Steve Lehman. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Where'd that go? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I Who knows? We, we, yeah. Uh, we don't read that one out loud. Yeah. We just, we just, flip. It. it's I hear it. I hear sad it. to say it's like yeah. the Midwest. We just turn past those pages. We, Yo. We do the Genesis, right? Mm -hmm. And then we skip right to the New Testament. We might yeah. stop on Ruth. Yep, yeah. yep. Yeah. We might stop, you know, yeah. but we're just. Yeah. Yep. Over. Yep. yep. <laughs> that is yep. awesome. Oh yep. my gosh. I this yep. oh so yep. much fun. We're having a good time. This is really fun. This is um really fun. so we're we're getting up to our 90 minute mark and yep. um I do want to respect your time. Um but thank you so much for being here with us. There's a lot of interesting conversation. Yeah. Um and that's